Evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us here at the, uh, the University of Bedfordshire uh, from the, the School of Sports Science and Physical Activity. Um, my name's Dr. Marty Morris. I'm head of school here. Uh, and, and alongside me here is Dr. Jeff Aldous, who is the course coordinator for Sport and Exercise Science. Um, the idea of tonight is to give you a bit of a flavour for some of the things that we get up to within Sport and Exercise Science, both in terms of you know, studying here, but also some of the research and consultancy uh, aspects that uh, that we get up to. Um, hopefully, you'll uh, you'll find it enjoyable. You've got opportunity to ask us questions, not just about the session, but also about what it's like to to study with us. And you can put those uh, in the uh, in the comments section on the on the right hand side. Um, the topic tonight is on performing in the heat. So many of you might be going off on your holidays within Europe and uh, will have seen uh, the extreme temperatures that everyone's uh, uh, enduring at the, at the moment. And hopefully what this will give you a bit of a flavour about how we measure that in our laboratories, um, how the body responds to it um, and, and the, how we can work with athletes to help them improve their performance in those in these kind of conditions. So hopefully you might have a, a takeaway to, to help you uh, on your holidays or perhaps if you're going away to, you know, to perform, perform in sport it, it, itself. Um, this is being recorded. So again, if you're watching this on, on playback, um, there will be an email address um, on the uh, on, on the end of the slides that you'll be able to send it. You know, if you have any questions for us, that we'll be able to pick up and, and get back to you. OK, so, um, yeah, please do feel free to put comments you know, throughout the uh, presentation. But now I'm just going to hand over to, uh, to to Jeff to take us through the session today. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Martin, uh, for, the, um, for, for your uh, chat there. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk through my slides that should appear on the screen in a second, as they have. Brilliant. Uh, so this is, as, I, as Martin mentioned, it's going to be a uh, kind of sample lecture of something you would experience on um, the BSc Sport and Exercise Science degree. And it's going to be around the area of thermal physiology, but I've kind of called it performing in the heat. So on this uh, on my next slide i'm going to talk through um what the objectives are of this particular session so i'm going to talk to you about the differences between heat stress and heat strain so what components meet make up heat stress so that's the external environment and then how that heat stress actually affects the body during sport and exercise so that we call that heat strain on the body and then I'm going to bring that all together to talk about a live case study uh, from what we did at the University of Bedfordshire, where we worked with a Team GB ultramarathon athlete and talked to uh, and worked through with them how we could prepare them for competition in the heat. Uh, I'm going to talk through that in my uh, next few slides. So I'll move on to the first part and we'll talk through about what components make up heat stress. Now, typically, we just think that the ambient temperature of the environment is what is heat stress. But it goes relatively beyond that with three other factors that we need to consider. One of those is relative humidity. Now, relative humidity is actually the moisture that, or the water content within the atmosphere. And we measure that within a percentage. And relative humidity increases when we see more water content within the atmosphere. Now, alongside that, we also need to consider another factor, which is solar radiation. And that is the amount of direct heat that we get from the sun itself. And heat stress will obviously increase as we increase the amount of solar radiation. And as well as that, obviously, when we increase the relative humidity as well, so we get more moisture content as well, that then subsequently means we've got greater heat stress as well. Now, one factor that we can use that can actually mitigate that, but then also strengthen the heat stress as well is the air velocity. So air velocity is typically the amount of wind that we have within the atmosphere. And actually, if we have really high solar radiation, then actually that's going to mean that potentially we're blowing more heat onto the body, which actually means we're going to get hotter quicker. But equally as well, if we actually end up with a higher wind, higher wind velocity or air velocity, and we actually have a decrease in solar radiation, a decrease in heat, that can work in a way to cool us down. But all four of those factors actually allow us to understand 
the factors that make up environmental heat stress. Now, on this uh, next slide, what you can see is how all four of these components can be used to make up one particular heat stress index. And the heat stress index I'm going to talk about is what we call wet bulb globe temperature. Now, this particular heat stress index is used in a variety of different occupational and sport settings. So an example of an occupational setting where this is used would be within the army or other armed forces where they're going into uh, particular combat situations, etc. As well as that, in sport settings, uh, FIFA for football, um, tennis as well, they will all use this wet bulb globe temperature um, as well as a way of understanding when play can occur and when it can't or when breaks need to occur. So it's quite a complicated equation and I'm not going to go into the in-depth parts of this, but what wet bulb globe temperature comprises of is the wet bulb. So that is the amount of moisture or um, kind of water content within the air, which is the relative humidity and also the wind speed of that. Now, the wind speed is important because the way that a wet bulb globe temperature monitor is, it's kind of got a wick that sits on the top, which is wetted. Uh, and as kind of the air velocity blows across that, that's then used to help calculate wet bulb globe temperature. We also have the globe temperature, so the amount of direct heat that comes from the sun. And then we have the dry bulb element, so the amount of heat within the atmosphere as well. And all of those are put into one equation to then give us one particular temperature to understand the whole of the environmental heat stress. Now, that's really important and really helpful because if you're then working with athletes or if you're working with um, occupational setting as well, you're not having to look at four different numbers. You're getting one particular number which can then help us understand and determine the heat stress within that particular environment. Now, on this next slide, what I've provided you with is an example of where that's used in sport. Now, football, as we know, is probably the most common sport played in the world. And, and FIFA typically use wet bulb globe temperature, particularly in a lot of their summer tournaments. And you can see here, this is the official wet uh, wet bulb globe temperature um, thresholds that they use within these particular tournaments. Now you can see there 24 to 29 and 29 to 32. These are telling us about the moderate and the high risk of a thermal injury. So a thermal injury could be something like a exertional heat illness, such as um, heat stroke or heat exhaustion, okay, where the body's got so hot that subsequently it's actually not able to uh, continue to exercise any longer. And actually it could result in an individual collapsing. And if they don't re uh, don't receive the medical care they need, then actually it could result in ultimately in death. Now, Moderate to high risk is obviously something that's manageable, uh, manageable by athletes and support staff can do that. However, if wet bulb globe temperature gets beyond 32 degrees, FIFA actually categorise this as extreme. And their advice is that potentially play is suspended if it gets too high, but also we use mandatory cooling breaks. And actually, as you see there of my example of the newspaper article that I've taken, these particular thresholds came in just prior to the 2014 FIFA World Cup, uh, which took place in Brazil. And this Bra the Brazilian World Cup was uh, really well um, thought about prior to the tournament, uh, expected to be a really, really exciting tournament. But ultimately, they were worried about the heat because um, South American summer known to be very hot. And actually, that's why they bought in these mandatory cooling breaks. And this was used in the game between Netherlands and Mexico, the quarterfinal in the first time, where in the 30th minute of each half, players stopped and they had three minutes to cool down in whatever means possible and then continued with the final 15 minutes of the match. And it was hoped that that would cool the body down enough prior to them actually beginning um, to finishing that game off of each or finish each half off. And the temperatures actually got as high as 39 degrees centigrade in that particular match. So it was very much needed, this um, idea of having a mandatory cooling break. So I've spoke very much here about how heat stress affects the human body or heat stress kind of is happens uh, within the atmosphere. I'm now going to talk about on the next slide about how actually heat strain can subsequently alter 
um, exercise performance. Now, heat strain, as I mentioned, that's what actually happens within the human body. Now, with regards to heat strain, as I mentioned before, if we see increases in ambient temperature, relative humidity, uh, solar radiation, uh, and subsequently a decrease in wind speed, that increases the environmental heat stress that we see and then puts the body under greater strain. And this particular working model here by NIBO in 2014 just highlights all of the plethora of different responses that occur within the heat. Now, one of the things that you'll see is at the top there, you'll see kind of neurobiology, central nervous system changes. So as the human body gets hotter, the brain gets hotter. And that can have a knock on effect to a number of different physiological mechanisms, such as oxygen delivery. OK, and that very much comes from changes um, from cardiovascular responses. So as the core of the body gets warmer, so the center of the body gets warmer, we subsequently begin to see that the heart has to work harder and it has to work harder because it needs to try and move as much heat away from the center of the body and move that as far away as possible. Now, by moving that as far away as possible, it's trying to move it to the skin. So but it's also trying to deliver heat or blood, sorry, to the working muscles. So what it then creates is this idea of the heart having to work harder to push blood to the skin and then being able to push blood to the muscles. So we've then got oxygenated muscles. So subsequently, performance can continue. So it creates this kind of mismatch between blood delivery to the muscle and blood delivery to the skin. And that's where when blood goes to the skin, we see an increase in skin blood flow. And then subsequently, we begin to see more sweating occur as a way of cooling us down. So as you can see there, there's lots of different things that are going on in the human body. And that's just very much a, a snapshot of what would happen or what we'd expect to happen. And in a more in-depth lecture, I would go into some more of those mechanisms. But the short version is basically we need to try and cool down the core of the body. So we do that ourselves by pushing more heat away to the skin um, whilst trying to maintain blood delivery to the muscle. And then we try and obviously increase our sweating response so that we can try to stay cool. So if we move on to the next slide, we're now going to talk about our example athlete that I mentioned before. So this here is Ian Hammett, who is a Team GB athlete and also an ultramarathon athlete. Now, an ultramarathon is obviously greater than a marathon, and he competed in an ultramarathon in the heat, which involved the called the Spartathlon. And the Spartathlon, as shown on the next slide, is a 153 mile road race, um, which goes from Sparta to Greece. So he went from Sparta to Greece in a 36 hour period. So he had that's the duration of time he had available to do that. And obviously, if he didn't go do it in 36 hours, then that would have been him finished. And you can see there, these are some of the ambient temperatures of 35 degrees centigrade. The relative humidity was quite high as well. So the atmosphere is made up of at least 60 percent of water. And these are some of the temperatures in the environment that he was likely to experience during this race. So not is it, only is he going to be um, racing for a long period of time, 36 hours, he's also going to be exercising in quite a lot of the time in the daytime in very warm and humid conditions. So Ian came to us and wanted to find ways that he could optimise and improve his performance because he knew that actually the heat was going to have a negative effect on his performance during the race. So as you can see on this next slide, these are some of the options that we went through with Ian and what he could use to beat the heat. So I'm going to talk about heat acclimation and acclimatization in the moment, because uh, that's going to be the main focus of this particular lecture. But you also had different options available, such as pre-cooling. So cooling the body down prior to the prior to exercise. So trying to cool down his core temperature, his skin temperature, trying to hydrate because he knew he'd be sweating a lot. So trying to drink as much fluid as possible to try and maintain the body, the total body water that he had. And also per cooling. So this is cooling during the exercise. So whilst he's running around for running for 36 hours or as long as that period would as he needed to to complete the race. Again, another option that he could use. 
But the ones I'm going to focus on today are heat acclimation and acclimatization because they are the, considered the gold standard. So the best possible method that we can use to be able to mitigate and best adapt to the heat. So on this next slide here, you can see the definitions for both heat acclimation and heat acclimatization. Now, often these are confused um, within uh, the literature or just in kind of general day to day chat when when people are sort of talking about this topic area. But very much the difference is acclimation is the artificial environment where we have repeated exposures to a hot environment in a way to adapt. So what this would be is, as an example, going into a hot environment for 10 days in a row, but that hot environment being very much an artificial environment. So you can see there in this picture, an example of someone using an environmental chamber similar to the one that we have in, at the University of Bedfordshire. Now, this is great because obviously it means that you can use um, a really high tech piece of equipment that's not at many universities or uh, many kind of sports science facilities, um, but actually be able to um, artificially um, kind of have the environment very similar to what you'd expect it to be on race day. The opposite to that, which is acclimatization, that is again where you would have repeated exposures to the heat to have this kind of physiological adaptation. But instead, it's in a natural climate. So that would involve, for example, Ian, our athlete, going all the way to Greece for these 10 days prior to the event to be able to um, adapt physiologically to the environment. Now, whilst Ian was a Team GB athlete, that wasn't his full time job. His full time job was actually working in the fire service. So he was having to take time off work to go and do the race. So he couldn't take any more time off to go actually out to Greece prior to the event and actually be able to acclimate or acclimatise. So acclimatisation was not an option for him. And it's often not an option at all for many um, athletes because of the cost involved of going out to that place for a number of weeks beforehand. So acclimation was our main consideration that we had to best prepare him for his event. So I'm going to talk now about how we um, used acclimation with Ian prior to the event on this next slide. So because we wanted to use acclimation, we needed to think about the best ways to prepare him. And so we had a few questions um, that we needed to answer. Firstly, we're going to use heat acclimation. And I've said it's the gold standard. But why actually are we going to use it? What is the benefit of doing it? If we're going to do it, we obviously need to measure something to know if the heat acclimation is actually working. So we're going to talk about the different measurements that we can take during heat acclimation. There are different types of heat acclimation protocols, so we need to think about which one do we use. And also, how long are we going to perform this heat acclimation for? And then finally, how do we actually know if it's worked? It's all well and good, again, like I say, to do this. Um, and just measuring things for the sake of measuring them. But actually, we need to know, has this worked? So we can assess that by using something called a heat stress test, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. So let's start off thinking about why are we going to use heat acclimation? So on this next slide here, you'll firstly see this kind of heat acclimation model. So this was developed here by Taylor in 2014, and it's kind of the human heat adaptation model. So along the horizontal or the X axis, we have time. So if we think about that as number of days and then on the Y axis or the vertical axis here, we have the physiological response. And at the bottom there, you can see we've kind of got our currently. Where's that marker at at the moment? Kind of ad adaptation impulse. And the impulse is what we would call uh, the heat and also the exercise that we're doing. So if you think about it, every day we're adding heat, we're adding exercise. So that marker, we begin to see an adaptation growth. And we can see that within the green section here of that model. And over time, that from the heat and the exercise, as we begin to increase that impulse and we add the impulse more and more, we begin to adapt. And that subsequently means our performance is going to improve. Now, 
at some point we're going to hit a plateau. There's going to be a physiological plateau for every individual. It will differ based upon genetics and a number of different fa factors, but ultimately there's going to hit a plateau, which is ultimately where we kind of want to stop because that's when we know we're in our best condition, ready to actually commence our exercise performance. However, if we take that away, what's going to happen is we're going to begin to see a decay. If we're taking that impulse of heat and exercise away, that adaptation that we see into performance is going to subsequently begin to leave the, leave the human body and subsequently we're going to head back towards our pre-adaptation baseline. So what it meant was when we were thinking about using the heat acclimation for Ian, we wanted to do this as close as possible before he flew out to uh, Greece prior to the race. Because he was on flying out that day and then taking part in the race the, the next day or the, the second he landed, there was a short period of time where he'd be out there. So he'd be able to do a small amount of acclimatization. But we wanted that acclimation to be as close as possible to the flight so that it subsequently meant that he was able to maintain as much of that adaptation plateau as possible. So take home message here is to make sure that we use the heat acclimation as close as possible before we leave the event. So that was the first thing we, we thought about. So moving on to our next slide, we then thought about what are we actually going to measure? Because obviously we need to know if heat acclimation has been successful. And a paper by Sorkid 2011 identified that there are four key markers to understand if heat acclimation has been successful. The first two, our resting core temperature and our resting heart rate, are going to give us an understanding of our physiological strain. And with both of these particular markers, there is almost a kind of ceiling point, a plateau, where once we hit that ceiling point for both of these, that's where we're likely to see, most like, or most likely to see the termination of exercise, where we're going, going to stop, or we're going to fatigue too much that the performance is going to really drop off and subsequently not be valuable to our performance. So we're going to have a starting point for this. By doing heat acclimation, the thought is that we'll be able to re reduce our resting core temperature and reduce our resting heart rate so that actually we have a bigger window to work within. And subsequently, it's going to take longer to reach that ceiling point. So if we're able then to exercise for longer, that's going to have then subsequently a better benefit on performance. Now, whilst duration is not necessarily important for this race, what also is important is to think about is the exercise intensity. So if we're able to exercise at the same intensity, but at a lower heart rate or at a lower core temperature, then again, that's going to potentially mean we're able to push ourselves further. The other markers as well we need to think about here are sweat rate. So sweat rate is important because the more that we can sweat in the heat, that means that the more heat we're able to lose and we're able to keep ourselves cooler. So if we're able to improve sweat rate during exercise by lowering our core temperature, lowering our heart rate, that's again going to have a valuable effect upon exercise performance. And that's the other point that we need to consider. Has exercise performance improved? So for Ian in this particular um, race that he's doing, obviously, it's going to be his time to complete the race. If you can do it quicker, then it's going to have a benefit on exercise performance. So, again, that's something else that we need to consider with his heat acclimation. Have we improved exercise performance? So we knew that these were the four markers that we wanted to measure with Ian during the race. So moving on, we then needed to think as well about our, uh, just wait for the next slide to load, uh, the type of protocol that we wanted to actually use. Now, obviously, the way I've kind of spoke at the minute is where we just get in the heat and we exercise and we see an improvement. But that's not necessarily the case. There are a couple of different ways that we can actually begin to think about using a heat acclimation protocol. So, the first one that I'm going to talk about is self-regulated or constant. So a self-regulated or a constant um, heat acclimation protocol is basically that. Just getting somebody to go in the heat, to exercise um, at whatever intensity they feel most appropriate. It's nice and easy to do as a physiologist myself or if you're a student working with them at that time. You don't have to monitor anything. You just let them kind of go. 
But if I go back to that Taylor model I spoke about earlier, something that's really important is we want to try and increase their adaptation. And as we all probably know, to improve adaptation, there needs to be an element of progression and overload. So we need to try and add an overload to this so that we begin to see some type of adaptation. So the other option we've got is something called an isothermic heat acclimation protocol. Now, an isothermic heat acclimation protocol works by actually having an element of a progressive overload. So if you look at my slide here and you, I can see, obviously, there are two blue lines that you can actually see. But if you look at the one that comes straight from zero, so the, the, the one that's above the other blue line, you can see there that, that it just goes straight up. And it gets to a core temperature of 38.5 degrees. And then we maintain that for the remainder of the session. So the time along the bottom. So for the um, 90 minute period. Now, as you can see there, there's a second blue line. Now, thinking back to those markers that I mentioned in the Sorker paper, over the time of heat acclimation, we're going to decrease our resting core temperature. Now, core temperature is really important for us to measure during isothermic heat stress or isothermic sorry, heat acclimation, because what that's actually going to mean is uh, we're able to understand, is their core temperature decreasing from each visit, which means obviously it's working, but it means subsequently they're starting at a lower core temperature every time they come into the chamber. And we still want them to get to 38 and a half degrees each time. So that then actually means that they have to work harder to get to that 38 and a half degrees. So now there becomes this element of an adaptation occurring from a progressive overload from the exercise because the intensity increases, as well as that element of heat as well. So the isothermic heat acclimation is able to then subsequently give us the opportunity to progressively overload that individual uh, so that then actually we're beginning to actually have an element of heat acclimation occurring. So that's what we're going to uh, that's what we're going to use with Ian, because it's going to be the best possible method to ensure that we can acclimate it. So now moving on, we're going to talk about actually how long does heat acclimation need to be for? So what I've got here is a kind of it's called a forest plot. So it's basically a nice little plot that tells us the kind of the average or the mean for a particular marker, and this is for a meta-analysis. So this is a number of different references all combined together so we can get a kind of mean understanding here of what's going on for each of the markers. And for this particular meta-analysis from Tyler in 2016, they looked at these four classical heat acclimation markers. So they've got exercise performance, core temperature, sweat loss, and resting heart rate. Now, one of the most important things and pivotal things to take from this is that the longer the heat acclimation, so the more visits they did, that meant the biggest adaptation to things like core temperature, heart rate and also exercise performance. So the more heat acclimation, the more visits we're able to do, then the more adaptation. As well as that, it meant that as well that by using core temperature and heart rate, we're then actually able to understand as well if the exercise intensity is appropriate for us to use. Now, whilst this says here that a long term heat acclimation is important and good to use more than 15 days, I'm actually going to contradict myself in a moment when I talk about the particular model that we actually used with Ian uh, and the duration of timing. But I'll talk through that in, in a moment when I get to that subsequent slide. So the final question now that we needed to answer was about how do we measure if heat acclimation has actually worked by using an appropriate heat stress test? Now, a heat stress test needs to be appropriate for us to measure both physical and also their physiological capacity. And again, the paper by Sorker in 2011 identified these four different approaches. So VO2 max, so kind of the maximum aerobic oxygen uptake um, of that individual. Time to exhaustion. So if someone exercised for as long as possible until they couldn't exercise anymore. A time trial. So something like a 10K time trial. How long does it take them to complete that? 
and then also submaximal exercise. So fixed the duration, so maybe 40 minutes at 40% of their VO2 max, as an example. So as you can see there on the slide, I've kind of given positives and negatives about all of these particular ones. And I've kind of structured this in a way thinking about our um, submaximal exercise, uh, sorry, thinking about our exercise for our ultramarathon athlete. And the ultramarathon athlete, the one what I felt was most important, was the submaximal, because it could be used for the taper period where their training load is decreased, but also be competition specific because we can they don't exercise at maximum intensity for an ultramarathon. They actually exercise at roughly around 40 to 50 percent their VO2 max. So we can make it competition specific. So let's look at what we actually did with Ian now. So with Ian, we did 10 days of heat acclimation, of isothermic heat acclimation, uh, measuring core temperature so we could understand his uh, exercise um, capacity and progression, etc. from the overload. The heat stress test that we performed was 30 minutes of treadmill exercise, exercising at an RPE of 12, and we measured heart rate and core temperature every five minutes as well. So we did a heat stress test pre and post, and we did 10 days of heat acclimation for 90 minutes per day. OK, in 32 degrees, 80 percent relative humidity, what we expected it to be on race day. And we got him to 38 and a half degrees um, every time during those exercises. And we just made it made sure as well, obviously, that he maintained that throughout the duration of each 90 minute period. Um, we ensured that we reduced his training load either side of the heat acclimation that he did as well, because we knew there'd be an increased fatigue post session. And also we'd be uh, making sure it was as close as possible for when he was flying out to Greece. So he finished this heat acclimation on the 20th of September 2019. And on this next slide here, what you can see is some really nice pictures of Ian in the chamber. So it's our chamber at the university. And you can see there's a picture of myself working with Ian, but there's also a couple of other people as well. And these are two students that we had at the University of Bedfordshire at the time, two undergraduate students. We're just moving on to postgraduate research as well. So just highlighting to you that as a student here, you don't just have to kind of hear about this research in lectures uh, like myself that I'm delivering here. You can also be part of that as well and get hands on experience. So did it actually work? Let's look at the final results here. So we've got here, obviously, um, his heat acclimation and stress test um, scores. So prior to the um, exercise, his core temperature decreased, so 38.6.8 to 36.6. So we've de increased that window of, um, of kind of period of time that he had um, to actually uh, get to his kind of maximum core temperature. And the same for his heart rate. Again, that decreased from uh, 39 to 36 beats per minute for his resting heart rate. Sweat rate improved, so he was removing more heat as well. So he went from 1.1 litres uh, to 1.4 litres an hour as well. And his chosen speed <coughs> during the heat stress test, that increased by a kilometre of an hour as well. So it meant that actually he was working harder at a lower exercise intensity just from those 10 days of heat acclimation. And look here, you can see from his results from 2017, where he did no heat acclimation, where he finished 28th, 2019, where he performed the heat acclimation. He finished sixth. He was the second highest Brit um, and he cut off over two hours from his time. And there you can see him um, at the end of the race, uh, kind of what they do at the end is where they, they kiss the boot there of the statue to, to signify they finished. So just to finish off some take home messages from what we've spoken about today um, on this next slide. So. Hot environments, as we know, they're a barrier to perform optimal exercise performance. And we know that if we um, heat acclimate for as long as possible, um, that's going to give us our largest adaptation. As I mentioned before with Ian, we only did 10 days. That's because he had a job and it meant that he only had that 10 day period um, to actually perform the heat acclimation. Isothermic is best to ensure we uh, have a progressive overload, but we need to make sure we measure those four classical heat acclimation markers to ensure that we have an um, exercise intensity that's relevant enough. 
And we also need to think about using a um, heat stress test that is appropriate for the physiological need of that um, individual. Over here as well, we've got an example guided learning task or something we might ask you to do at the university if you were in this in this uh, lecture um, within your, your year. Um, we'd ask you to maybe read this paper and think about some of the historical and the physical uh, factors that are needed to be considered for heat acclimation and they'd be added to the discussion board. Um, that's everything in the lecture. Thank you very much for um, listening. Um, I think um, Martin and I are going to go through some of the questions that have come in um, over the duration of my uh, lecture. That's brilliant. Uh, thank, thanks, Jeff. And certainly, uh, the kind of environmental physiology was certainly a reason why I got into sport and exercise science and kind of trying to understand, again, how the body responds uh, you know, to, to performing in kind of extreme environments. So hopefully, again, thanks to those of you that uh, have, have watched today or are watching it back on, on record. Um, you know, hopefully that gave you a bit of an insight as to, you know, perhaps when you're seeing things in the news or teams or athletes that have travelled and competing, um, you know, you get an understanding of the work that goes on as a sports scientist uh, to really understand how athletes respond and how they can adapt or, like say, acclimate to the environment to then before be able to improve their performance. So hopefully it gave you a bit of a flavour about that. And there's actually been some um, some great questions coming in here. Uh, got to actually yeah, one coming from Adam. So how will global warming affect world athletics? So that's a one live one coming in, Jeff. How will sorry, uh, I just cut out there as you said that well, apologies. So, how will global warming affect world athletics? How will global warming affect uh, world athletics? Uh, it obviously means that as the environment begins to get hotter, um, there's going to be a greater emphasis put on ensuring that athletes do remain safe. Uh, so something like the uh, something like the wet bulb globe temperature that I spoke about, which is obviously the heat stress index, there's going to be greater emphasis probably put on that to ensure that we measure that. Um, so we can get a full kind of holistic understanding of environmental heat stress and more advice put in place to ensure that we keep those athletes safe. Um, I think, if, as I mentioned, there's, it's going to get warmer and global warming is a thing. It is happening. Um, so the advice will probably be to ensure that where possible breaks occur um, in events. So where possible additional breaks, like I said, in sort of team sports like football, uh, rugby, as an example. But kind of mass participation events or kind of longer endura uh, endurance events, we actually saw happen um, in the Tokyo Olympics, where actually uh, they moved the start of the marathon to early in the morning and actually moved it north away from Tokyo, where they expected the environments to be cooler. So I think there's going to be um, a lot of logistical changes, not necessarily um, just going to be about kind of working directly with the athlete and thinking about interventions you can use directly with them, thinking about logistical changes as well. But a really good question. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. Uh, so an online question. So the, the labs you showed in the slides, do students actually get to use them? Um, I'll hand that one over to you, Jeff. Yeah, you definitely do. So I I really wanted to show that slide. I think it was my um, second or third to last slide. I really wanted to kind of drive that one home that actually it's not just staff members that get to use um, some of the equipment that we've got. It's actually also going to be you as students. So the students that we uh, that come to the university, they're given opportunities to be part of our human performance centre. And I think um, uh, Martin's modelling one of our polo shirts for the Human Performance Centre, I can see there. Um, you, you have the opportunity, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, you have the opportunity to actually be part of um, something where you can work directly with athletes, you can um, actually support them uh, in ensuring that they are um, ready for competition. But as well as that, you also have the opportunity as well to be uh, do this in teaching as well. So all of the equipment in all of our labs and the, I can just see there it's flashed up, flashed about the virtual tours, all the equipment in lessons you'll be taught and shown how to use. And then you can use them within your dissertations. Um, you can use them 
um, for other assessments that you might be doing, case study assessments, etc., within other units as well. So it's not just there for show, it's not just there for research, it's for you as students to use so you can be most fully prepared for going into the working world. Yeah, definitely. Everything, um, yeah, everything on campus is uh, is used by whether it be professors down to you know, the students um, in terms of, yeah, it's there, there to be used. So hopefully making you career ready in terms of, you know, different roles within the sport and exercise science kind of kind of world. So that's, um, yeah, another another great question. Another one coming more about choosing courses, actually. Um, it says it can't decide between studying sport and exercise science or strength and conditioning. So two, obviously, degrees that we offer here at Bedfordshire. Um, kind of what's the difference, I guess, or, or which ones should they go for? Well, I would say that to decide which one to go for, you actually don't need to make that decision now because we have at the University of Everchir the opportunity of doing sport and exercise science and strength and conditioning is now one um, common first year. So regardless of which degree you're on, you will do the same first year. And actually now what that means is at the end of your first year, you can then make that decision of which one you want to go and do. Because you might have got to the end of your first year and thought, I really enjoyed the strength and conditioning unit. That's where I see myself going. Or actually, that might have been when you started your degree thinking, I'm really going to enjoy that. But actually, you've gone into it and it's not been your favourite one. You've really enjoyed the nutrition. You've really enjoyed the physiology side of the degree. So subsequently, that might be the choice that you would make. So my, my um, suggestion would be for, for this stage to go with which one um you, you currently feel most comfortable to go with but ultimately it's not until the end of the first year where you need to make that real decision um and we'd be more than happy to help you with making that decision um because that common first year can allow you to help you make that decision moving forwards yeah great and that's so, certainly something we do within you know within the school of sports science and physical activity so a number of our courses have a common first year so offers that kind of flexibility so whether it be in the sport and pe in some of the sports therapy and our football course as well offer that flexibility to be able to um, start your course and then obviously get a flavor for potentially other other routes so offering that bit of flexibility so that's um yeah a great great question um i'll, I'll take another one that's just come in so um around what placement opportunities there are so um i mean a great example in uh, in, in jeff's um presentation so a number of students get involved in some of the things that, that take place on, on campus so whether that be within our human performance center we also have a, a clinical exercise um, clinic a community exercise clinic where again we have external uh, patients and clients that come on that again mostly run by students again it allows people to um, our students to get uh, SIMSPA so accredited uh, endorsed sorry um, professional standards so things like gym instructor personal trainer things embedded into their um into, into the course um but also we set up a lot of um uh, external partnerships so with Luton Town so you, you um, might have seen in the press uh, one of our current students is now uh, so it was on the on the pitch at Wembley when they won uh, in the playoff final but was working in in the sports science department and that's continued now into into the premiership um in rugby so with Bedford Blues Amptill um all sorts of opportunities in terms of within like sport development um, aspects as well with, with different community um, groups as well. So a lot of a lot of placement opportunities and we place a big emphasis on students taking up those opportunities. Um, hopefully that's reflected in uh, why we're the third in the UK in the um, complete university guide for graduate outcomes, which is basically it, how many of our graduates are getting into graduate roles. So, um, yeah, we place a big emphasis on that. So lots of placements, hopefully that uh, kind of tick a box for, for everyone coming coming through. Um, another one here, um, how much is a gym membership? A bit of a side issue, but a good one, a good question. Um, so this year it's um, it's actually free. So we've just, um, just opened up a brand new strength and conditioning suite. Um, so in, in addition to the, to the normal gym as well, we've got, brand new strength and conditioning suite, but actually as, as part of the you know, cost of living and also you know, the importance of being physically active, you know, mental health and et cetera. So the university is, is now offering free gym membership for both students and staff. So, um, so hopefully that isn't a barrier um, for, for, for keeping fit. Um, yeah, slightly different question there. Um, and one last one um, I've got here is 
around uh, scholarships. Um, again, I'll, I'll take this one. So we we have uh, two different types here in terms of academic, but also sporting scholarships. So uh, on the academic front, um, there's a link there. Perfect timing. Um, keep pointing the wrong way because the camera is backwards. Um, yeah, in terms of from an academic perspective. So again, we have a higher achiever one. So um, over 112 UCAS points, you qualify for uh, £2,400 um, in uh, a, a in funding, um, paid every February, £800. I get asked that all, all the time. So in terms of supporting your, your studies. But also, if you're a, um, um, a high-performing athlete or involved in sport or coaching, officiating, um, things like that, we also have a range of sports scholarships from Platinum. So we've had some students that have recently um, been at the, the Commonwealth Games last year that, that got um, the highest level of, of funding down, down to bronze. And these things kind of cover your training, um, kit, travel, um, anything to kind of support your involvement in that in that sport or or um, activity. So again, um, you can see the information come up there um, on the uh, on the screen in terms of finding out more information um, about that. Um, I can't see any more questions coming through. Um, obviously, I'm aware that some of you might you might be watching this um, on on playback, so it's been been recorded. Um, there will be an email address on the final slide, um, so study at beds.ac.uk, that you can send any questions through to us. There you go, perfect timing. Um, that uh, that you can send any questions through, you know, about whether it be about our courses, about what Jeff's presented today, um, and um, someone will get back to you, um, you know, the relevant person, um, whoever it, uh, it, it refers to. So, um, well, I'll, first of all, thank Jeff um, for his time today in terms of delivering some of that work that he does both from a research and a consultancy perspective, but also, like I said, feeds nicely into the uh, into the courses that, that we deliver here. And thank you for those questions. So the people that have engaged with us tonight um, and, and also hopefully some more questions that come through um, when you when you watch it on playback. So, uh, yeah, hope to speak, speak to you all soon. And um, yeah, thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, as well, for listening. Really appreciate it.